You may wish to adjust the dial. You're currently tuned into the wrong station. It should be no surprise that holidays shift and change over time, evolve, mutate, one might say, and Halloween is no different. It is a well-established holiday in this era of human history. We can easily trace its lineage back to the 9th century. Further back still, Halloween's ancestors slipped from shadow to shadow within the murky depths of time. Like Australopithecus, their shape is familiar, even if the details are not. But still, going from a pious Christian feast day to a rollicking, devil-worshipping, alcohol-soaked sex extravaganza in a mere thousand years is no mean feat. With the legacy this storied, it begs the question, what will Halloween become? What will social evolution bring to bear on Halloween's offspring in 20 years? 50 years? 1,000 years? What is the shape of Halloween after Halloween? Halloween, present day. So this one time, a couple years ago, I broke my arm on Halloween night. Not in any kind of fun or glamorous way. I didn't do it elbow dropping a pool table or something like that. No, I was on my bike delivering pizza to the kind of party where that might happen when I hit a pothole and went over the handlebars. So, yeah, embarrassing and mundane. But anyway, the broken arm isn't the point. The important thing is that I was sitting in the emergency department on All Hallows' Eve, and that I was sitting there for a while. Thank you, healthcare cuts. And if you've never been in the hospital on Halloween, let's just say... You see a lot of things. Like this one guy. Middle-aged, maybe forty-something. Pretty unassuming. I saw him from behind at first as he was talking to the nurse at the desk and grabbing an intake form. It was only when he turned around that I realized something was wrong with him. His gut was sticking out almost a full foot from the rest of his torso. Now, I'm not saying he was a big guy. In fact, his face looked pretty trim, and his clothes were well-fitted except for where his stomach pushed out and strained the fiber and elastic. He sat down with a groan as his midsection shifted around into different oblong shapes, and little bumps popped out and in all over before settling again. But when he noticed me, staring with a worried look on my face, he laughed it off. <laughs> Took things a bit too far, I think, he said. The way he explained it, he wanted to pull one of those viral video pranks on his kids. You know, like the shit that Jimmy Kimmel has on his show every year where you tell your kids that you ate all their trick-or-treat candy and catch their sorrow and dismay on film to show the world what a sociopath you are. Except, this guy didn't quite get the premise, I think. See, usually you just hide the candy and tell the kids you ate it. But this guy... Those strange bumps on his stomach started to come into sharper focus under his merino sweater. Under his skin. I could see the outline of candy corns and the unmistakable hexagonal prism of a double bubble. I tell you, he continued. Halfway through the second bag, I thought I'd have to call it quits. But you gotta commit to the bit. You just gotta commit to the bit. And then he gave me a devilish grin and lifted his sweater with a Check this out, kind of cock of the eyebrow. He started moving things around with his hands, rearranging them until I could see a full-size chocolate bar pushing through his linings. Still in one piece. Oh, no, Henry, guessing by the length and shape. I let him get back to filling out his forms. But that's not all I saw that night, not by a long shot. There was another guy, 
I hadn't noticed him at first, and he was sitting a few seats down from me, doubled over, clenching his stomach, slowly rocking himself back and forth. Christ, not another one, I thought. But no, this was something else. For starters, this guy was much younger. Maybe college age, but he could have been as young as 16. Probably didn't even know who Jimmy Kimmel was. He was not a well man. He was sweating profusely. He was, I don't know if it was gas, but he had a bog-like odor about him, and he was covered, covered in boils. I slid over. Something compelled me. I just wanted to help the poor bastard out. Hey, man, can I go get you, like, a ginger ale or something? No, man, no. Thanks. I just... Oh, I just drank something real bad. It's, uh... It's not agreeing with me. He started telling me how he'd been at this party. Was this the party where those pizzas had been going? One of life's mysteries, to this day. But yeah, he'd been at this party, at a really old house, as he described it. By the sound of it, real, classic Ontario Gothic. Probably sitting on a hill somewhere in Rosedale, all straight lines and modest pallets. And, while at this party, he ran out of booze. So he asks the host if he can bum a can or a bottle off them, and they, probably being a consummate host and member of a family who are multi-generational owners of prime Toronto real estate, are more than happy to oblige. Sure thing, they say. Just go down into the basement and grab something off the shelf. You can't miss it. So, he went down into the basement. But he was already a bit far gone, you see. Had some trouble finding where the PBRs were. He did, however, find another set of stairs going down. Though he told me there wasn't much in that cellar either, aside from rat droppings and jarred ferments. But somehow, blowing dust off the floor and fumbling around at old planks, he found another set of stairs. This continued for some time as down and down he went, passing the foundations and sub-foundations of the house, passing old stone, older than the city, passing tunnels carved too perfectly out of the mud and clay, passing stale air and floating scraps of paper holding long-lost words, gibberish to speak aloud, and finally finding a shelf. A shelf that someone, or something, had dug into a dark, earthen wall. A shelf with a bottle on it, dirty and ancient. A bottle that he plucked from the shelf, uncorked, sniffed, swished around, and downed in three quick plugs. Yeah, man, he told me. It was green, but like, it was also bubbling, so I figured the carbonation was still good. Oh. The nurse came and collected him soon after, thank God. Those boils were starting to scab over in scale. But yes, this carried on all night. The bad, blighted, and downright beaten shuffling in and out of that waiting room. And I saw it all. Pumpkins stuck on heads, bodies encased after tripping into excess spider webs, the results of blood play gone wrong. I would say I waited until the witching hour, but the witches were all tucked in in their pajamas by the time they called my name. It must have been about 4 a.m. in the empty waiting room by then. But just as I was standing up, someone else, one last person in full costume, wandered in. Or... Well, I thought it was a costume at first. Kind of unmistakable, it was a total classic. One of those ones where it's an all-black bodysuit with a glow-in-the-dark skeleton stitched on. Except, I guess I noticed the toes first. Because, well, there were toes. It wasn't a costume sock worn over a shoe or part of a onesie. This person had just painted their toes, and the rest of their body as it dawned on me a half-second later, jet black. But there was more than that. More and worse. I saw now that there was a certain three-dimensionality to their costume. I'd assumed the bones were painted on as well. But I was very wrong. Along the legs and arms, narrow troughs of flesh had been carved away to reveal the femurs, tibia, humerus, radius. Similar channels had been dug all over the body, finely and precisely chiseled. To give the torso the appearance of a more natural bevel, the ribs had been pulled and teased out somewhat, one of them a little bit too far, as it jutted out of the body and offered a glimpse at the red behind. And the face... Well, I couldn't look very long. 
It's one thing to stare at a skeleton in a museum or lab, skull stripped of cartilage and soft tissue. But it's another to see that same visage on a walking, breathing human, knowing they've somehow done that to themselves and are still standing. The nurse behind reception rose to her feet, and her hand shot to the phone with no delay. A doctor was storming down a hallway from further inside the hospital, screaming at attendants, telling them to prepare a room. You fool! You idiot! Do you realize what you've done? The air was heavy with silence and dread. The faceless patient said nothing, having trimmed away the muscles needed to move their jaw. You've painted your bones glow in the dark! Do you know how toxic that stuff is? And moments later, they were carted off. I mean, good. It sounds like it was serious. Me, I had to wait around a little while longer. But eventually, I got my x-ray, painkillers, all that. Now, it was nearly the crack of dawn. And as the night nurse, back behind her counter, was telling me how to keep my cast clean, it occurred to me for the first time that she too had been there all night. She'd seen all the same shit that I had. Every freak accident. Every freak. And suddenly I felt a real sense of camaraderie with this person. With this beleaguered champion of a gutted healthcare system. Uh, some night, huh? I said, hoping to at least get a chuckle. Instead, she just looked up at me. And looking back into her eyes, I realized how little I had or will ever see. Some night, she said. She'd come back on Friday. Halloween, 25 years hence. This is my costume, Crackle insisted. I'm dressed as an irradiated mutant. Oh yeah, real creative. Spike Milligan rolled their many eyes. Showed up dressed as yourself. Halloween, 570 years hence. It had been 35 years since the free state of Indo-Zealand deployed a bioweapon through the global fiber optic network. The result? Worldwide infertility. Christopher and Victoria had been trying for a child when the plague hit. Their dreams of little feet pitter-pattering through the house were put on hold, and as the months stretched into years, their hope began to curdle into despair. Each day became mere drudgery, a slow funeral procession. Like 15% of the dwindling population, they spent 10 hours a day toiling away in their research roles at the government biolabs, searching for even a glimmer of fertility. Year after year of dead ends took a toll on even the most stubborn researcher, and eventually it all came apart. Victoria had passed away a few summers ago, Christopher holding her hand as it cooled in the afternoon sun. For months, he'd been inconsolable. But today, his heart was light. Airy, even. Today, there would be candy, jack-o'-lanterns, and... Yes, by some miracle, there would even be trick-or-treaters. What a joy. What a blessing. This year had been especially hard. It was a year filled with war and death thanks to the constant off-world missions sponsored by the world government. These interplanetary wars were a necessity. Who's to say the secret of human fertility didn't reside on another planet? But now there was a specter that hung over the process. An awareness that these wartime deaths were more permanent than those of historical combat. Each human life lost was a grain falling through a broken hourglass. The sand at the top could never be refilled. But still, trick-or-treaters. The War Council had promised trick-or-treaters. Christopher stood on his porch pasting a plastic ghost decal to his door. His neighbor, Rodney, waved to him. Chris, can you believe it? The breathless enthusiasm made his aging face young again. The War Council news blast says it's going to start at 7 p.m. Yeah, but that's at the end of the street, said Christopher, pointing down the long road of their endless domed suburb. Probably be closer to 8.30 by the time they get to us. Oh, all right. Who was the last trick-or-treater you saw in this neighborhood? Asked Rodney. It was, uh, Will, uh, William something? Yes, William Shell Burger King, said Chris, about, uh, 28 years ago. Right, right. What's William up to now? Uh, dead. Shot by the meat vandals when he left the dome. Oh, jeez, said Rodney, 
suddenly looking every one of his 73 years. Ain't that a kick in the teeth? There was a moment of silence, as they remembered Will in his little devil costume, prancing around the neighborhood with his state-chosen parents shepherding him from door to door. The two men smiled, filled with the ache of the past and the anxiety of the future. Then, waving at one another with forced cheerfulness, they returned to their empty homes to await the miracle. It wasn't too long to wait. From a distance, Christopher heard the sound of little feet on the sidewalk. He heard them trundle up the walk to Rodney's house, heard the muted conversation, but refused to get up. His mouth was dry, his hands clenched tight. This had to be done exactly correctly. Who knew if he'd ever get another chance? Then, the doorbell. Christopher launched his bones from the chair and bolted to the door. He took a deep breath, counted to three, and then swung it wide. Who would be at my door at this hour? said Christopher in his best dad voice. On the porch stood a horrible creature. A long, shiny, segmented body coiled on the porch, suspended on thousands of spindly legs, each barely more than a hair's width. On one end of this chitinous monster, a hooked stinger bulged with pouches of black, unctuous venom. And the other end of this creature would perhaps have been even more sickening. To you or I. A chubby pink face, quite like a child's, teetered nine feet in the air, staring down at Christopher. Two scimitar-shaped mandibles erupted from the cheeks. The monster swayed, and its segments made a horrible as they rubbed together, like wind chimes made of nightmares. It leaned down close to Christopher, its drooling mouth opened, closed, opened again. The mandibles twitched. Finally, it forced out the sound he'd been longing to hear for almost thirty years. The off-world wars were expensive. The planet was nearly bankrupt. But damn it, the fertility question was too important. Humanity could not be without children. They were a symbol of the future. Without them, civilization would crumble to even less than it already had. If a cure for infertility was to be found after so much failure, some hope must remain alive. By any means necessary. Animatronic children were the obvious choice. But they were resource-intensive, and their movements felt too artificial. It made one nauseous. A different solution had to be found. Oh-ho! said Christopher, eyeing the monstrosity. What a lovely costume, kiddo! Krella fourteen had taken years to colonize, but the prize was well worth it. The natural environment had evolved a unique variety of megapede, a massive arthropod that due to a few genetic quirks, just so happened to have a face and upper body almost identical to that of a human child. They were said to have the intelligence of a seven-year-old as well. It was a perfect solution. Who cared that the megapede's body continued on for 15 feet longer than that of a real human child? Thousands of beautiful, beautiful peds were captured by brave human soldiers. From there, all that was needed to control the ped was a rather simple external brain implant shunted through a puncture in the carapace. In fact, the backpack battery that powered the implant even added to the illusion of childhood. They'd labeled it a Jansport. The Megapede clumsily held out a pillowcase with five of its boyish arms, and who cared that they had six joints each? Christopher's eyes rolled with gleeful ecstasy. His breathing became shallow. He felt alive. This was the moment. He brought out the bowl of candy, ancient Baby Ruth bars salvaged from an old Baltimore warehouse, their wrappers filled with dust and disease. Christopher portioned out three and dropped them gently into the Megapede's bag. Now, don't go spoiling your dinner, young man, said Christopher. Happy Halloween! The Megapede's oozing brain implant forcibly bore it away from their front door and towards the next house, administering sharp electric shocks whenever the Pede attempted to override control. Christopher closed his eyes as it went. The joyful pitter-patter of its many feet made him feel 
for a split second, like the father he would never be. Oh, Victoria, her perfect boy, her perfect, beautiful boy. Halloween, 40,000 years hence. Electric guitar wails faintly over the battlefield as General Cat Pumpkins climbs a hill of dead bodies, the black and orange banner still hanging tattered from the laser spear he clutches in the blood-slick fingers of his power armor. Only a few of his men still live, yet each has slaughtered more than their fair share of elves and reindeer. Gentlemen! He cries, flinging down the head of the enemy captain he slew in single combat. I claim this battlefield in the name of Halloween. The men raise a ragged cheer as the enemy captain's head tumbles down the heap of corpses, eventually settling in a pool of half-congealed gore. No longer did the blank eyes twinkle. No longer were the dimples merry. No longer did his belly jiggle like a bowl full of jelly. Fucking Santa Claus's head man. Jesus. Halloween, 400,000 years hence. Loristan stepped from the changing pod. So, what do you think? They asked. Oh, hell yeah, said Wildy, their three heads harmonizing bass alto-soprano as they always did. That's mega hot. Pileto is gonna be all over you. You look like a total slut bot 9,000. No, 12,000! Luristan turned, and the holographic images turned with them. They'd chosen the right body mods. Non-Euclidean curves, ten penetration apparati, four additional lactation bulges of varying sizes, not to mention a sparkling collection of the hottest glands on the market. And, of course, the costume. The piece de resistance. A Vanta black lace mini-shawl wrapped around Luristan's sensuous form. It was identical to the one worn by Verity McGubble in the hollow film series Attack of the 500-Foot Cosmo Beasts. However, there was one important difference. Loristan's mini-shawl was made from face silk collected from unspiders. The shawl would randomly blink out of existence throughout the night. Each time it did, it would leave Loristan completely nude, revealing everything, especially those luscious, luscious glands. Pilito would indeed be into it. Luristan knew how much Pilito liked glands. Tonight they would become one beneath the triple moons of cough. And if not, well, Pilito wouldn't be the only hot bag of flesh at the party. Halloween 30 million years hence. It had been five million years since any contact from the galactic government. Two million since they'd heard from another planet. Humanity's dark age appeared endless. And yet humanity itself soldiered on. Old Snapjaw rubbed his scaly chin, looking out at the inhabitants of Volusk. The oral traditions told of their departure to this vicious world over ten million years ago. A drastic mistake in retrospect. Volusk planet of toxic gas and impassable jagged mountains. Volusk, whose environment severely isolated their settlements, slowly creating twenty distinct species of human. Volusk, who some called Poison Mother. But once a decade, the arsenic fog would lift, the acid rivers would recede, and the boiling magma would cool. This was the peacetime, and the settlements would come together to discuss matters of trade and see how each other had grown. Old Snapjaw was hosting the peacetime this decade, and he was nervous. It had not been a good decade on Volusk. What crops they had had endured severe losses. Earthquakes had ravaged the Lunas Valley, driving away several edible animal species. A new parasitic illness had been discovered in Pallet Lake. Horrid things, even for people used to horror. In the light of the bonfire, the twisted, vaguely human shapes of his brothers and sisters appeared anemic and wilted. Half were depressed, and the other half were itching for a fight. They awaited his opening remarks with barely concealed contempt. But what could old Snapjaw say? How can one even begin to connect such a disparate group? It seemed hopeless. 
A light wind blew through, carrying the bonfire's aroma of ash and decaying plant matter into old Snapjaw's nasal slits. The scent triggered a long, dormant section of his earth-human brain. The orange in the flames unlocked an ancient mausoleum in his mind, releasing the spirits of long-dead cultures. Forgotten oral tradition bubbled forth. Old Snapjaw spoke. My friends, he began. A tint of playful menace entered his voice as he instinctively stood as the bonfire lit his face from below. Have I ever told you the legend of the hook-handed man? Halloween, 80 billion years hence. And now, though the last sun had long since spent its glow, and the last planet subsided into silent entropy and eternity in the past, yet life still lingered in nigh-incomprehensible form within the fuliginous sepulchres of black dwarf stars. What vivacity remained at this stage of the universe's senescence was only bacterial, fungal, or at the utmost height of its complexity, vermiform. And yet, by virtue of psychic hive mind, these worm-like remnants were able to achieve as yet unsampled heights of civilization and understanding. All the unthinkable vastness of space was their playground, and though the scattered corpses of the galaxies lay so far apart that light could never span their distance not in sixty times the lifespan of the universe that you or I have known so far, yet the vermiforms considered this no hindrance whatsoever, for their grand community was never more than a thought away. What would feeble man have done with such a power? Squandered it, surely, in petty games of psychic contest. Yet the vermiforms were made of less crude spirit, for all their hylomorphical shortcomings. Yea, standing at a metaphorical hilltop overlooking the vast cemetery of creation, they took it upon themselves to become chroniclers of all that had gone before, so that if some roaming god should chance upon the mummified coil of our universe, it might be able to leaf through, as it were, the dry record of all our triumphs and failures, and then if it were so inclined, even draw upon them for the creation of a better universe. And so, by slow mental trawling, they gathered up what scattered psychic impressions still transversed the endless atramentous night, and began to sort through them. And it was thus, quite by accident, that these vermiforms came to celebrate what we must legally consider to be a Halloween. Ah, behold, my brethren! I see me the vest of an ancient thought in robbing this dead cinder of a star. Incidentally, I should inform you that the first community of vermiforms projected its thought with the voice of the Halloween Kaiser, a creation of the 21st century podcast, Wrong Station, and the second with the voice of Chancellor Peter Lorre, another of the show's entirely original characters. Yes, yes, there was civilization in this place once upon a time. You speak truly, fellow hive mind. Ah. Here comes one such memory now, drifting slow across the cold vastness of space and time. Come, let us sample the sorts of this long dead race, that we may commemorate them for whatever future may exist beyond this moribund age. And then, like sibyls inhaling theogenic fumes, these thousand hive minds wafted up the last remaining psychic impressions of the human species. The first thing they experienced was this. A ladle sliding into a bowl of red punch, and then sluicing sticky glucose juice into a red plastic cup. In the background throbbed a pounding, insistent music that the vermiforms did not, of course, recognize as rhythm as a dancer by the German Euro dance group Schnapp. Nor did they recognize this white space with gray floors as an office. And nor did they understand the meaning of the shiny cats and pumpkins of black and orange tinsel strewn about the walls and cubicles. They had no concept for Halloween in their culture. And yet, they were about to experience it. A small bottle of yellow alcohol was unscrewed and poured into the red cup. The woman drinking it garbed in black vestments. A priestess of some description, the vermiform surmised. They'd come across this thing called religion before, in which case the red fluid must serve a sacral purpose, and the crimson man of juice depicted on the packet lying off to one side, well, he must have been their prophet. Oh my god, Gina, I love your costume. A man in a black hat and t-shirt. A black wig. This one I immediately dislike. Mm, you speak truly, fellow hive mind. Sister act? So good. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Shut the fuck up, Bill, the priestess said. That reference feels dated already. But before the priestess could continue her, they assumed ritual tirade. A new figure entered the office temple. 
a man wearing large glasses and an unconvincing blonde wig. At his appearance, the music fell silent with a record scratch, and an audible gasp went up from all gathered. Jesus Christ, the priestess muttered, as the wigged man approached the two of them with arms held out, smiling and doing a little spin to show off his gray tracksuit. Hey, guys, what do you think? Pretty funny, huh? Donnie, I gotta tell you, that costume is totally not schwing. Come on, don't be so politically correct thought police, Bill. Gina, you like it, right? Donnie, you fucking idiot. It is October 1992, and it is way too soon for you to be dressed like Jeffrey Dahmer. At this point, the vermiforms withdrew their psychic tendrils from the mind cloud. I don't like this place. Thou speak truly, fellow hive mind. I don't like these people. The vibes, they are off. Let us pretend we didn't find this one. Yes, let them be consigned to oblivion. And so the vermiforms never learned how Donnie refused to acknowledge that his costume was in at least bad taste, and neither did they learn how Gina went home with Donnie that night anyway, on account of her lack of self-esteem. And that was the last anybody ever heard of the human species. And the last they ever heard of... Halloween. The Wrong Station is made possible with the generous support of our listeners on Patreon. Patrons can listen to The Wrong Station ad-free, as well as get access to bonus episodes, discussions, and more. This week's episode, Halloween After Halloween, was written by Alexander Saxton, Anthony Botello, and Jacob Duarte Spiegel. Thank you to Anna Tixis, Selena F., Jazz, Marina Black, and John P. Rommel. And a very special thanks to Victoria, Wildy, and Spike Milligan for helping us keep the lights, well, off. The Wrong Station is co-produced by Alexander Saxton, Anthony Botello, and Jacob Duarte Spiel, with music composed and performed on the piano by Elan Citrin, and arranged for the viola and performed by Viola Schmidt. You can follow The Wrong Station on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and email us at therongstation at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>